Hello and welcome to GameSack. Let's talk about some more obscure 3D platformers. Now, I really like these episodes because the majority of these games were suggested by you guys. And the reason I like them is because I hadn't heard about a lot of these games until you suggested them, and I probably would have never played them otherwise. So, yay, new experiences for me. And while they all can't be winners, I really did enjoy a lot of the games in this one. So, let's start out with some Looney Tunes. Here's Duck Dodger starring Daffy Duck, which was released in 2000 exclusively for the once popular Nintendo 64 console from Infogrames. I don't care if I'm pronouncing Infogrames correctly or not. They kind of don't deserve it anyway if they're going to pick a name like that. In this one, you play as Daffy Duck in his Duck Dodgers persona, as you may have already guessed by now. Marvin the Martian has created a huge super weapon to destroy Earth, but he needs atoms for it to work. Yeah, just atoms. He sends his lackeys to go get some atoms. You're tasked with stopping Marvin and collecting the atoms before he does. So in each area, you'll want to collect all of the atoms that you can. And, like all atoms, these are about the size of a cantaloupe. Daffy can jump and double jump. He can kick, but this isn't helpful at all. In fact, most enemies you can't really do much to except for the bosses. Sometimes you'll be able to get a ray gun or something to temporarily fry an enemy, but it doesn't last long. Daffy can even sneak by holding the R shoulder button. You can also swim, and you don't have to worry about running out of air, which is probably the nicest thing about swimming in this game. The controls are all kind of awful. The game has a horrible camera, which makes the controls seem even worse than they are. There are a few different options for the camera, like locking it behind Daffy. I only found this useful when trying to cross thin wooden beams like this, but I still had issues which made it frustrating. The auto mode, which is the default for the camera, is indeed the best, but it's still absolutely horrible. Let's not ignore the atrocious frame rate. It averages just under 20 frames a second most of the time, and I've seen it go lower than 15 frames per second. What's funny is that some of the cutscenes run at 60 frames per second. That right there is highly unusual for the console. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make here is that not only does it look horrendous, but it actually gives the controls lag, which doesn't benefit the game at all. Like here, in part of the first level, I'm trying to get an atom that's up on the ledge. In order to do this, I need to jump from this ledge to the tracks right above. Of course, the camera doesn't center correctly, and the cars keep coming and coming, and often you can't see them. It is mind-numbing how frustrating this is. Fortunately, you don't have to collect all of the atoms unless you want the best ending. Other parts of the game, like here with these rocket packs, can initially be kind of angrifying. I don't think angrifying is a real word, but I've already said frustrating too much and thesaurus.com isn't helping me out here. Anyway, they have a limited range and are super hard to steer. You'll likely lose a bunch of lives before you figure out where you need to go. You definitely need to know exactly where you're going when you take off with one of these. Fortunately, even if you get a game over, you can restart the game and the large majority of your progress will still be intact, even if you haven't saved yet. I know this because at one point while playing, I jumped on this moving cart that maybe I wasn't supposed to jump on. I wasn't sure if the game was glitching or if maybe they spiked my Chipotle burrito with that special Colorado seasoning. I tried to get out of it, but I think I got stuck behind an invisible wall as I couldn't get back to the beginning of the level in order to go out and then back in the door to reset the glitch. So I quit the game from the menu and started over from scratch, and most of the atoms I had collected, I still had. Also, I would knocked over this thing before the glitch and it was still knocked over as well. So let that be a lesson to you, don't give up no matter what happens. Each area isn't overly big, but finding the atoms is harder than you might think. The graphics are more or less typical for the system once you look past the awful camera and the frame rate. Actually, there's really not any fog at all, so the game should be commended for that. So I've got to say that this game looks fantastic for the time, just as long as it's not moving. For the sound, you've got some good dialogue, and I assume it's Joe Alasky doing the voices. Are you ready, Space Cadet? Absolutely, if, 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 uh, Commander, sir. The way he's been able to almost perfectly mimic so many of the Looney Tunes characters has always blown me away. He's nearly perfect, and I loved him on Tiny Tunes. Rest in peace, Mr. Alasky. Oops. Had the silly thing in reverse. The music is fine, but some of it might get on your nerves if you make it your mission to get each and every atom, because you'll be listening to it a lot. Overall, I enjoyed this game more than it has any right to be enjoyed. 
Obviously, the masses of video gamers in the day didn't enjoy it much, otherwise it might get mentioned more from time to time. Despite the issues, and they are big issues, it's worth playing if you can stomach the camera and the frame rate. Here's Bugs Bunny Lost in Time for the PlayStation, which came out in 1999. There was also a PC version of this one. This is another Looney Tunes game from Infogrames. This is a much, much worse game than Duck Dodgers, despite being a significantly smoother experience. You play as Bugs, who zapped back in time because he turned on what he thought was a giant carrot juicer. Now, he has to move through different periods of time in order to get back to the present, meeting versions of various Looney Tunes characters along the way. In order to do this, he needs to collect golden carrots and clocks that are placed throughout the various levels. First off, Bugs does not control well at all. This is partially because the camera feels like it's always moving and it's never pointed in the way that you want it to be. The L2 and R2 buttons help swing it around, which is better than nothing, I suppose. Jumping can be difficult because it's quite hard to judge depth and therefore fall to your death. Sometimes this is due to the camera, but you really need to watch Bugs' shadow to tell where he is. The problem is that sometimes there's no ground on which to cast a shadow. You can attack enemies by rolling into them, jumping on their heads, or kicking them in the butt. Most of them can't be killed by being rolled into. Jumping on their heads usually only stuns them, but at least it helps you bounce higher. Your kicks are almost worthless. You need to be behind the enemy and they can't be aware of your existence at all, so you need to tire them out first or sneak up on them. And even then, the range of your kick is extremely short and you have to be precisely behind them, which is more difficult than it sounds, especially with these awful controls. Not only that, but your hitbox seems to be significantly bigger than you are as it's really easy to take damage from something the game thinks you touched. Hey! The visuals are perfectly fine for a Looney Tunes game from this era, and like I mentioned, at least the frame rate is much better than Duck Dodgers, a game which would come out a year after this one. Bugs Bunny's voice is done here by Billy West, and he does a good imitation, but you can tell it's not really Mel Blanc. You know, that's a good trick, Moyle old Goyle. Can you do this one? And yes, that's how he pronounced his own name. That's right, I have a ton more respect for Mel Blanc than I do for Infogrames. The music here is decent for a Looney Tunes game and it doesn't get annoying. Still, I could only play this game for so long, mainly because of the awful collision and the horrible camera. This game doesn't get talked about much, and in this case, that's a good thing. Alright, we've got the Looney Tunes games out of the way, though I'm sure there are probably other 3D platformers that are made by Infogram. I'm sorry, Infogrames. And I've gotten a lot of requests for this next game, and I'm afraid that those of you who suggested it may not like me very much after this. Anyway, let's go. This is Dr. Mudo from Midway, released in 2002 for the PS2, Xbox, GameCube, and the Game Boy Advance. I'm playing the Xbox version here. You're Dr. Mudo, a mad scientist who's always coming up with crazy insane things. You try to solve the energy crisis, but end up accidentally destroying a planet instead. Now you're off to collect a bunch of different crap to rebuild the planet that blew up and maybe find out what really happened along the way. And yes, you will collect a ton of crap in this one. There's so much stuff to collect that I'm not even gonna try to describe everything. All you need to know is that if you can grab it, then you should probably grab it. One thing I'd like to point out though, is that when you collect hearts, your life isn't refilled. After you grab a bunch of heart containers, you get an extra heart added to your life bar, which defaults to only three. It's very easy to quickly lose all of your hearts when the enemies dogpile you. If you die, you go back to only having three hearts. Sometimes you'll refill an empty heart after collecting tons upon tons of hearts. You can jump and also double jump. You can zap enemies, which extracts their DNA, which you need. Another button is your attack, which will destroy most enemies. There are some enemies which you need to zap and grab and then toss them in one way or another in order to destroy them or activate or break certain things. 
Some enemies seem outright invincible and you should just run from them. The last button you have is your morph button. Right away, you can morph into a mouse to get into small areas, at least when the game lets you. You can still jump and attack as a mouse, but you can't use your DNA zapper thing. You can acquire new forms to morph into by extracting DNA from enemies, but of course the game will let you know when you're finally able to do that. Overall, I'd say the control is quite good when it comes to moving and jumping and shooting and things like that. The camera, of course, is an issue like it is in the very large majority of 3D platformers. You can adjust it with the right analog stick so that's helpful, but more often than not the camera wasn't pointing where I wanted to look. Sometimes the game will even go into a 2D view for you to navigate brief portions of a level here and there. Speaking of the levels, they are absolutely huge and go on and on and never seem to end. In fact, I never made it to the end of the first planet I went to just because I got bored. Extremely bored, in fact. I didn't feel like the game was progressing at all and there was just always one more room to go through. It felt more like a chore and like I was wasting my life accomplishing exactly nothing. The levels are so big that I can't imagine anyone playing through this game more than once. The good news is, is that there are a lot of save points and you have unlimited lives. So you can play until you get bored, stop, and then come back the next day and eventually get through the planets. If you're more patient than I am, then you'll probably enjoy this more than I did. The graphics are average for the time. On the Xbox, they run in 480p and probably the GameCube as well. I've seen some websites list this game as having a widescreen mode, but it doesn't. The game seems to run at a locked 30 frames per second, which is fairly typical for the time. The music isn't anything special, it's just kind of there in the background, not calling much attention to itself. The voices are pretty good though. I like Dr. Mudo's mad scientist character. Monkeys, eh? Crazy looking monkeys? I hate monkeys. Especially the crazy looking kind. He often talks with his computer back home called Al, which is heavily based on the HAL computer from the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. You're getting closer to the vats, Doctor, and doing better than I expected. I thought you'd be dead by now. Dr. Mudo received low to average reviews back when it was released. That's certainly understandable as the game has pacing issues and, like I mentioned, it gets boring rather quickly. It's no wonder that it didn't catch on with the gaming public and became obscure. Hey, this episode is about obscure 3D platformers. That doesn't mean they have to be good as well, right? Here we have Metal Arms, Glitch in the System from Swingin' Ape Studios and Vivendi, released in 2003. This is on the PS2, GameCube, Xbox, and Xbox 360. I'm playing on a regular ass Xbox here. This game is more of a third person shooter, but there's plenty of platforming, so I guess I can just barely include it in this episode. You play as a robot who's found all glitched out and then repaired by the Robot Rebellion. You go to work right away, running around and blasting other robots, all of whom are very alive. Some of them even fart, because that's what robots do. It controls like a third person shooter where you're constantly steering with the second analog stick. Hey, that means the camera is not really an issue with this game. If you press left or right on the left analog stick, you strafe left and right. You have a jump and, of course, a double jump. You fire your weapons with the R trigger and throw powerful grenades with the L trigger. You collect lots of different weapons and you select between them by holding down B and then cycling through them. There's an option just to use the D-pad, but it never seemed to work for me for whatever reason. Sometimes you're even able to take over other robots if you find special chips. You then use these robots to massacre their own kind from behind enemy lines. I thought that this was a pretty cool concept. After you're done murdering everybody, at least in this scene, you throw yourself into the machine and short it out. Then you watch the room blow up and crumble from a safe distance. Pretty cool. Other times you can ride vehicles, like here where I'm in this flying thingy. For some reason, they switched out to controls here and the L trigger fires your gun instead of the R trigger. 
I don't know why they did that, but thanks to my super evolved human brain, I was able to adapt within three minutes. Overall, the game is very responsive. One issue with the game is that often you're not sure what to do or where to go next. Your radio buddy isn't very helpful and the level design isn't such that it makes anything clear. I often found myself wandering around back and forth, clueless. The fact that everything kind of looks, well, samey means that you might overlook something. Like here, there are two doors, but I never thought to go through the second one because I thought it was the same door that I'd already been through and found nothing. This happens more often than it should in this game, and honestly, it's the worst part of it. Maybe play with a guide or something if you get stuck, because otherwise it's pretty fun. There's also a local multiplayer mode that I didn't play since, of course, I have no friends. The visuals are pretty nice for the original Xbox. It runs at an uncapped frame rate, which means it's all over the place. Usually, it's pretty good, though. Unfortunately, there is some screen tearing, but I got used to it. Doesn't mean that I liked it, but I got used to it. Aside from the sameness of some of the level designs, everything looks really nice. Glitch himself is well modeled and animated. There's some music here, and some of it's even pretty good, but it doesn't always play. The sound in this game is pretty good, especially if you have your Xbox hooked up optically and in Dolby Digital. There's lots of discrete sounds happening all around you. There's hardly any subwoofer during gameplay though, which is kind of disappointing when big things blow up. The game received decent reviews when it came out, and it was available everywhere. I'm not really sure why it never really got a whole lot of love. I'd personally like to try the Xbox 360 version to check out the updated graphics. Maybe that one has less screen tearing? Granted, the Xbox 360 is the king of screen tearing, at least it was at the beginning of its life. Still, this one is worth trying out for sure. Just don't be surprised if you find yourself running around empty areas wondering what to do next now and again. Okay, I'm going to play the victim here for including Metal Arms in this episode, even though it wasn't a true 3D platformer, because it was suggested by you guys. Just kidding, I'm not going to play the victim, but I did decide not to also include Medieval for the PSP, which was also suggested by you guys, because it also isn't really a 3D platformer, it's more of an action-adventure game. I did play it for a while, though, and I did enjoy it. But anyway, let's make sure our suggestions are actually 3D platformers from now on. And for this next game, I never really played it much at all before now, maybe a couple minutes, 10 years ago, maybe 15, however long it was, but it just never really appealed to me. Turns out I've been wrong. Now it's time to talk about Billy Hatcher and the Giant Egg from Sega, exclusively for the Nintendo GameCube. You could not get this anywhere else. Actually, it was also on the PC in Europe for some reason. It was released in 2003. The crows are casting nighttime over the entire world because that's what crows do. They are also capturing the chicken elders in each land and trapping them within golden eggs. That way, the elders can't call for morning because that's how morning happens. You're Billy Hatcher, who's a kid with special courage. You get a chicken suit and that gives you some chicken powers. Now you can grab eggs and roll them around. Rolling eggs onto enemies can damage or kill them. If you feed an egg fruit, it grows bigger, kind of like Katamari Damacy. The bigger it is, the more damage it will do to the enemies. It will only grow so big though. Once it's at its biggest, you can press the R button to hatch the egg. It depends on the egg what hatches. Sometimes it can be an extra life. Other times it can be nothing. But the most useful thing are the different Pokemon, I mean different animals. These all have unique powers to help you along your way. Team up with a hashed animal and then use the X button to toss it and use its powers. The penguin will cause water to put out fires, for example. The egg will also enable you to do many things in order to get around the level, like ride on rails, bounce higher in lieu of a double jump, fly through colored rings which remind me of Mario Galaxy, and things like that. Billy is almost completely useless without an egg, so you'll want to make sure to have one almost all of the time. Be careful though, because the eggs are not invincible. They can crack when they're damaged, and if they take too much more abuse, they'll be destroyed and disappear. If this happens when you're rolling one of the golden elder eggs around, you lose a life. 
The game saves after each level, so at least you have unlimited continues as a result. Once you hatch an elder egg, that particular land turns from night into morning and becomes bright. Each stage has several different objectives and it's set up in a very similar fashion to Super Mario 64. Even though this is a Sega game made by the legendary Yuji Naka, I was just never interested in picking this one up. I didn't like the idea of always having to push an egg around for the entire game. It reminded me of that stupid soccer kick game where you have to kick a soccer ball around and you're useless without it. Actually, I think they love this game over in Europe, which means they probably love Billy Hatcher that much more over there. I bet that's why they got a PC version of this game. Anyway, it seems like most people agreed with me as it wasn't a huge seller by any means, and there's been no cult following for this game, and no one seems to be urging Sega to make a follow-up. That's not to say that this game is bad, because it certainly isn't. It does take some time to get a good feel for the physics of the eggs, but once you do, you'll be having a good time here. I like launching my egg like a boomerang to attack the bosses. There are actually quite a few different things you can do with it. The graphics are excellent and full of color. The frame rate's pretty good, usually running around 60 frames per second most of the time, but it can and does drop if things get too hectic. So if you see that happen, please don't be frightened. Yuji Naka's ambition was perhaps a bit too much for the GameCube. Now, if he had put it on the 32X instead, it would have been perfect. The title screen music doesn't give you much hope for the soundtrack as it's not pleasant at all. But the in-game music is actually really good and fun to listen to. The sound effects can be silly, but they're never annoying. I say take a chance on this game. Granted, it's not tremendously cheap, so maybe just emulate it for now. Although I'm not super fond of pushing something around the entire time, it's still way more enjoyable than I thought it would be. This game combines Katamari Damacy, Soccer Kid, Pokemon, and hell, even some Super Monkey Ball in a pretty good way. Finally, we have Scalar from Global Star Software, published in 2004. I'm playing it on the Nintendo GameCube here, but it's also available for the Microsoft Xbox and the Sony PlayStation 2 consoles. I've never heard anyone mention anything about this one. I was actually surprised with how much I enjoyed this one. You're some kid who gets kidnapped for some unknown reason and then electrocuted while strapped to a chair. That's pretty dark if you ask me. But this just turns you into a lizard, and now suddenly you find yourself needing to save not only the entire universe, but the entire multiverse as well. That was a good move on the part of the designers. Saving only the entire universe really isn't high enough stakes at all anymore. It's like saving only one or two people, nobody cares. Hopefully string theory or something can come up with more things beyond the multiverse that we need to save in video games once we decide that these stakes are just too low. Anyway, you can jump and double jump, of course. You also have two attacks from the get-go. You can punch with your fists if you're close enough to an enemy. The good news is that this has a pretty good reach and does a lot of damage. For the smaller enemies, you can zap them with your tongue. You can also do this to bust open plants and whatnot. You'll also be collecting a lot of these yellow orbs which acts as currency. And you'll be using this currency to evolve yourself with expanded moves and abilities at some points in the game. You can grind on rails from time to time, which is pretty fun. As you do this, you build up a charge. If you're charged, pressing the R button will let you do a big zap to get multiple enemies around you. Eventually, you'll earn the ability to transform into different things. Wow! This is the bomb! Like this bomb dude who's always carrying around this bomb ball thingy. He can drop it where he stands or roll it and then detonate it. It's really fun to play as this little guy. Unfortunately, he can't move as fast, double jump, or grind rails like your lizard form can. No biggie as you can switch back and forth at any time. Sometimes you'll even need to turn invisible briefly to sneak past certain enemies. The levels are absolutely gigantic, but they never get boring, at least nowhere near as boring as Dr. Mudo's levels do. You always feel like you're making some sort of progress, and you're definitely always having fun, and I like that. I recommend going into the option screen and making sure everything like the map is always on screen unless you're severely worried about image retention on your screen. The map being on the lower left all the time really helps out. 
There are multiple objectives that you need to do in each area, but you don't need to do them all at once. Yes, there are boss fights and they exist in their own level. Sometimes they can be cheap, like here where I was running away for dear life, but accidentally ran off the edge that I couldn't see. The good news is, is that you have unlimited lives and the game does a great job of making you want to keep trying until you get it right. Everything feels incredibly snappy as you play. It's not perfect, but rarely do you feel that your death wasn't your fault. That edge on the boss fight I just mentioned was definitely one example of it not being my fault. But hey, I learned from that and I didn't do it again. The visuals are generally pretty good, often with some great color. The frame rate is once again all over the place, at least on the GameCube version here. The game runs in 480p on the Xbox only, but I forced the GameCube version here into 480p with Swiss. The music is pretty good most of the time and it helps keep the excitement up. I'm not sure why this one doesn't get more love, it's certainly not a bad game. I would even say that it's criminally overlooked. It's certainly not the best 3D platformer ever or anything, but it's definitely worth a play. There you go, more obscure 3D platformers for you. And I've got to admit, ever since I played and wrote my review for Billy Hatcher, I've been thinking about that game quite a bit. It really is fun. Now, he's not the most appealing character in the world, but hey, we've just all got to look past that. Anyway, what are some more obscure 3D platformers out there that you think I should cover? And remember, only 3D platformers, not 3D action games this time. Anyway, let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameZack. PlayStation 4 is a cool console, it's enjoyed by thousands of people, and a couple of years after it was released, it got a marginal upgrade in the form of the PlayStation 4 Pro, which made it marginally better. However, what about the old Nintendo 64? Why can't it get a similar upgrade so it can be marginally better? Will now have introducing the Nintendo 69. Nice! 69 bit power! Nice! 69 times cleaner graphics! Nice! 69 times the fun! Nice! The Nintendo 69! Nice!